That was totally over the top, but appreciated. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank you, Rohit, uh, for having me here, too. Uh, I, I feel really lucky and honored to get to work with CG, and, uh, and it's been a real thrill to give this talk and to think about it a bit. And, and in, in preparing for it, while at the same time watching this rapidly evolving news cycle in the space that has really been something to behold, with escalating public debate about fake news, misinformation, election hacking, how we're gonna regulate platforms. I kept coming back to an increasing sense that we're in a moment of anxiety, or at least I am. Anxiety about the ways technologies are impacting our lives, about the ways we're losing grip with collective social conversations, about the character of our civic discourse, and about the integrity of our democracy. And I think this is anxiety is, is being felt widely. It's being felt in governments. I think it's being felt in technology companies increasingly and in the wider public. And so tonight what I want to do is try and put a little shape to why I think we're feeling this anxiety. So just to back up a little bit, I think it, we need to state from the onset that the internet has, in my mind, undoubtedly been a force for tremendous good in the world. In its first phase of evolution, Web 1.0 empowered the marginalized and gave voice to those who were excluded from public debate. In the second phase, Web 2.0, we saw both the rise of social media and all its disruptive impacts, and also an aggressive pushback from, disrupt, from, from established actors. But I now think we're in a different phase, that the internet is, some, is now something different. Um, and I, I would just broadly call this the platform era, era. So what do I mean by this? The, the internet as most people experience it now, most people in the world who engage with the internet, um, the internet they experience is controlled by four platform companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple, worth a combined $2.7 trillion. These once nimble startups now span the globe, serve billions of users, and increasingly mit mitigate core functions in our society. For most users, they literally are the internet. And this, of course, is not necessarily a bad thing. These companies have, done, have added tremendous things to our, to our social lives. But it does deserve pause, I think. In particular, we need to think carefully about the discourse platforms are enabling and how they will govern and be governed. And in that spirit, I want to make three arguments over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, the first is that fake news or misinformation and the debate about them is important not because of any impact on any election, although that is important, but I think more so because it reveals structural problems embedded in our digital infrastructure. Second, these structural problems are having a range of ne discrete negative impacts on the, what I would broadly call the character of our civic discourse. I'll walk through some of those. And third, this reveals a set of very challenging governance problems at the core of our democracies. So first, about digital infrastructure. On January 10th, 2017, President Obama used his final speech as president to deliver a warning to the American people. We become increasingly secure in our siloed bubbles of information, he argued, and are growing isolated from one another by competing facts. If Eisenhower used his final address to call out the military industrial complex, Obama's message was more dire. Democracy itself is at risk. Two months earlier, as Aaron mentioned, on the sidelines of a meeting of world leaders in Peru, Obama urged Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to take the impact of disinformation on the election seriously. A remarkable exchange nine days after Zuckerberg had pub publicly dismissed the idea as crazy. To understand how we got here, though, I mean, this is an amazing moment just unfolding before our eyes. Um, to understand how we got here, though, I think it's helpful to start four years earlier. The morning after his re-election, a photo of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama embracing with the text four more years became one of the most shared photos in history. But it happened on Twitter. At the time, Facebook was largely used, it's amazing how fast it's changed, but at the time, was mostly used for sharing information about friends and family. 
a weekly or daily click, not the hour to hour or minute to minute engagement that's needed to compete in this platform economy. Over the next four years though, this changed radically. First, Facebook made their content more shareable. Eight days after the Obama photo, Facebook launched the equivalent of their retweet or their share function. This was followed by hashtags and then to significant consequence, something called trending topics. A new space in the corner of the homepage for stories getting attention across the platform. Information, content could now go viral on Facebook as it could on Twitter. Second, Facebook made a number of changes to their ad system. They began partnering with major data brokers to add more nuanced data to their records. They automated the purchasing of this data, which I'll talk about more later. And then they allowed ads into the news feed itself, into the central place in which users consume information in Facebook. The effect was immensely powerful. The click-through rates on news feed ads were 21 times higher than standard web ads. But this also had the effect of making paid content social inside Facebook. It could be liked, shared, and commented on, just like any other piece of content. Ads could go viral. Most importantly, though, paid content inside the platform was agnostic. It connected people with a message to sell with highly specified audiences. This product could be toothpaste, an NGO's message, or a campaign ad. It didn't matter. Third, in consultations with journalists, Facebook created something called Instant Articles. Try up there a tool which allowed publishers to distribute content directly inside the platform itself. Instead of linking out to content on their site, it could just sit within the ecosystem of Facebook itself. The New York Times could post an article directly inside the platform, getting faster load times, greater reach, and a cut of the ad revenue. Critically though, the Instant Article tool works so well that they opened it up to anyone, not just reputable publishers, who were the initial beta of this tool. Marketers, content producers, and political campaigns around the world could all use this really powerful tool. What's more, everything published in Instant Articles now looked like journalism. Here's a false story from the election beside one from the New York Times, both published inside Instant Articles. A fourth change that I want to mention briefly was brought about by controversy. On May 9th, 2016, in the lead up to the election, Gizmodo, the technology site, revealed that Facebook's trending topics was actively, were actively curated by people who suppressed conservative news. A week later, a dozen conservative leaders flew to Silicon Valley to meet with Facebook's leadership, with Peter Thiel as their intermediary in the middle, who's a Facebook board member. As part of their response, Facebook fired the human editors of trending, making it fully algorithmic. Any liberal biases of the human editors were now replaced by the subjectivities embedded in Facebook's code. Less than 48 hours after the last curator had left the building at Facebook, trend, the, trend, the trending article list was subsumed with false and offensive material. We know what happened after that. As Craig Silverman reported for BuzzFeed at the time, the next three months would see a spike in what he called fake news, misinformation made to look like legitimate journalism. During this critical period leading up to the election, the top 20 false stories on Facebook generated greater engagement than the top 20 stories from major news outlets. So by the 2016 election, Facebook now had nearly 2 billion active users, 2 trillion searchable posts, and a billion new posts a day. They reached more people than any other media organization in history, and they largely controlled the distribution, monetization, and audience for journalism. But to get from that moment of concern in 2012 with the photo of Obama being tweeted, also meant making key design changes to the platform that I think in retrospect created the ideal conditions for fake news. New tools created the potential for virality. Tools such as instant articles, legitimized Facebook for news and then blurred the lines between different types of content. Automated and, automated and content agnostic ads allowed a wide range of content directly into our feeds and getting rid of humans allowed an algorithm to run wild. Irrespective of intent, which is a whole other question here, um, this presents a challenge I think for our democracy um, and one that we need to meet head on. 
So, so what's going on here? Um, with around this fake news debate and this changes to the Facebook platform. Um, since the election, the term fake news has really become everything and nothing. Uh, to Trump, journalism is fake news. To journalists, fake news is a competing media space where lies taint the reality they seek to report. To social platforms, fake news is at once a revenue source, a PR problem, and a debate about objectivity and free speech I don't think they want to have. This has led many to dismiss the, con the concept and its consequences. Um, but I want to give a defense to fake news here, and I want to suggest that it's important not because of the 2016 election, because of the two key structural problems in our information architecture that it reveals. First, fake news and its effects are a product of the way our attention is increasingly surveilled, and that surveilled attention is monetized. Broadcast media once had a near monopoly on access to large audiences. If an advertiser wanted to reach a particular demographic, they'd purchase an ad space with a publisher that claimed to meet that group. That's what broadcast advertising was. Advertising technologies, though, or ad tech, has upended this model. Data brokers and platforms use vast sources of corporate surveillance and behavioral data to build highly specific and detailed profiles of each of their billions of users. These data are then bought and sold as commodities. Using this data, ads are then individually customized, inferring our moods, our desires, our fears, through our call records, our application data, and even the rhythm of our keyboard typing. This allows for more relevant ads, definitely. We now see things that we might want to buy inside these systems. But, it, but it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Facebook has told advertisers, for example, that it can identify when a teenager feels insecure, worthless, and when they need a confidence boost. Simply put, instead of buying an expensive generic ad on the New York Times to reach a broad demographic, these programmatic ads allow an advertiser to track a person around the internet and increasingly the physical world and precisely target them using highly personalized data and about, about all aspects of their lives. As Zainab Tufeki, who I think is one of the smartest scholars studying this um, at the moment, observed, think Huxley, not Orwell. 21st century surveillance and manipulation is new, individualized, and plays on our social needs. And of course, it's immensely profitable. Facebook's annual revenue, nearly all of which came from ads, last year has tripled in the past four years to last year at $2.7 billion. But it's also incentivized the spread of low over high quality content, enabled a race to the bottom of this surve sur consumer surveillance arms race, and created a free market for our attention. Anyone can now buy an audience. While the ecosystem may be mac maximized for selling products, it's equally as powerful for selling a political message. In, a, in one internal Facebook experiment, about 340,000 extra people turned out to vote in the 2010 congressional elections because of a single election day Facebook message highlighting their friends who had voted. The one on the top is the, is the control and the one on the bottom shows that people, your friends who had voted. And it turned out an extra 340,000 people. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, they got lots of people to vote. We've been trying to do that in all sorts of ways unsuccessfully. Um, but the problem is these tools can also be used for nefarious purposes, and, and I think increasingly they are. The second structural problem in this ecosystem um, is the way that our digital infrastructure is, is now shaped by artificial intelligence. For example, while there's a billion posts to Facebook every day, what we see as a single user is highly individualized, obviously. This personalization, personalization is done using a series of algorithms which, which while tremendously efficient and scalable, which is, is the key, they need to be scalable to manage this platform, these billions of posts a day, um, have some real implications. These algorithms are largely unknowable, even to those that created them, are at their core commercially driven, and are laden with the biases and subjectivities of their data and their creators. They're also leading to a further fragmentation of our collective conversation. And when combined with these personal data profiles, they, really, they do allow for this incredible micro-targeting of content. 
As Hillary Clinton recently spelled out, after Republicans lost in 2012, they spent over $100 million building out new data profiles of swing voters. But this data was of limited use without the tools to give this data meaning. So the campaign made a deal with a UK company, Cambridge Analytica, to combine this new data with their sentiment analysis, AI. Using the system, the Trump campaign ran and tested 40 to 50,000 simultaneous individualized micro-targeted ads on Facebook per day. Cambridge Analytica is owned by Robert, uh, Robert Mercer, a libertarian, bil libertarian billionaire who tested this very model in the Brexit campaign. A condition for his partnership with the Trump campaign was that they hire Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway. And I, and I think AI's role in our digital infrastructure is about to get a lot more complicated. For example, this is a demonstration of a software called Face to Face, which allows for live editing of facial video. I think by our next election in Canada, this type of tool could be used to create individualized versions of events and deliver them directly into our social feeds. Millions of simultaneous versions of reality instantly distributed. If fake text caused confusion in 2016 elections, fake video is going to upend our grounding of what is real. Fact or fabrication is going to be almost impossible to sort out. And this ungrounding, I think, will only get more pronounced as platform companies roll out their planned virtual worlds their augmented, and their augmented realities, words liter worlds literally created and determined by AI. So those are the structural problems that I see in this ecosystem. The, the second thing I want to talk about is the, the, the implications this has on our, our civic discourse. Um, let me just briefly explain a few, few implications of these technologies. First, um, on platforms, information can go viral regardless of its quality or veracity. It's amazing to have to, to say that, but it's fundamentally an attribute of these systems. This can, be in, this can be relatively benign. Craig Silverman, who did the fake news studies, recently reported on a strange case of viral fake videos of sharks swimming on freeways during natural disasters. This is the latest version from Hurricane Harvey, which quickly got over 100,000 retweets and 100, 100, 150,000 likes. Others were circulated widely, widely during Irene, Sandy, and Matthew. It just keeps popping up. A little bit more problematically on this spectrum, Craig's also reported on a fake video showing the impact of Hur Hurricane Irma that was viewed 25 million times and shared 855,000 times on Facebook and is still on the site. So uh, it's remarkable, right? Like these just random pieces of fake information massively disseminate into our consciousness. Um, but this same pattern can, of course, be far more pernicious. I just want to walk through one example of, of, a, of the many examples of fake news going viral in the election, in the U.S. election. So a man with only 40 Twitter fo followers in Austin saw a series of buses go down the street um, at, at around the time of a Trump rally. And he thought it was unusual. So he tweeted. Uh, the tweet said, Anti-Trump protesters in Austin today are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses they came in. Hashtag fake protests. Hashtag, hashtag Trump 2016. What happened is kind of amazing. The post, he has, remember he had 40 Twitter followers. The post quickly received 15,000 retweets and was then picked up by a Reddit, the main Reddit community for Trump called the Donald. It then spread to various viral hyperpartisan sites who were monetizing fake news um, during the election, one of which posted it to Facebook, which quickly got 300,000 shares. With the topic now in the mainstream, it was being discussed in the news, Trump tweeted about it, saying professional protesters had infiltrated his rallies. So the, the man who had originally posted this tweet eventually realized he was wrong. The buses were just for, local soft, for a local software co conference. Um, and to his credit, which usually doesn't happen, he, he posted this correction tweet, right, writing false on it. But it only got 20 retweets and went um, almost unnoticed. He then deleted the original tweet. But the problem was the his cat's out of the bag, right? The story was viral. And, and this, I think, is the problem. On platforms with global scale, the spread of content is quite literally uncontrollable. 
And even in the most horrific cases, it's unclear how platforms should respond to this kind of thing. For example, this, this article on the white supremacy site Daily Stormer, calling the woman who was killed in Charlottesville, Heather Hare, fat and ugly and making up a host of lies about her life, was shared 65,000 times in six hours and quickly rose to the top of Facebook's news section, that trending article section. Hare's personal Facebook page was then was simultaneously flooded with similarly hateful content until Facebook sensibly shut it down and banned the site from its platform, the Daily Caller. To do so, though, they needed to break user policies, data agreements, and make sweeping decisions about free speech, which I'll come back to towards the end. So I, I think you don't need to prove that election hacking or vote swaying, um, you don't have to prove that those were causal um, to see that there's a fundamental problem here. Fake information circulating at scale in our digital world is pernicious. The, the second civic implication of, this, uh, of those structural problems um, is that algorithms that are needed, the algorithms that are needed to operate at scale in these ecosystems um, are devoid of human nuance. The, the recent controversy, which I'm sure you've all read about, over automatic ad targeting is a really good example of this. So Ju Julia Angwin, who's a great reporter at ProPublica, found that Facebook users can be targeted to a variety of algorithmically created audiences that included Jew hater, how to burn Jews, and the history of why Jews ruin the world. This is all in sort of automatically generated pull-down menus recommending your ad audience. This issue was discreet, and it was fixed quickly, but it's illustrative of, a broad, illustrative of a much broader problem. Last year, Facebook faced a similar controversy when ProPublica again showed that ads for housing could be made to exclude certain minorities by selecting for, quote, ethnic affinity, breaking the, hair, the Fair Housing Act. Facebook now calls this filter multicultural affinity and they no longer allow it to be used for ads for housing, employment, or credit. Um, another example, on the day of a, re the re a recent bombing in the London Tube, a British television reporter found Amazon recommending bomb-making ingredients in their frequently bought together section. <laughs> Amazon has said it will review this algorithm. Um, and an Instagram user recently discovered that Facebook's ad algorithm had repurposed a hateful comment on her Instagram account as an ad for the, for the promise of engagement in Instagram. This included the, the photo that was put in this ad was a comment that said, I will rape you before I kill you, you filthy whore. A wide range of similar embarrassing and harmful and hateful ad recommendations using these types of algorithms has been found on other platforms, Google and Twitter. So, what does this tell us? Um, first, of course, no human at these companies populated these terms or wanted their tools to be used in this way. Um, and as soon as these things pop up, usually they get edited within the algorithms of these companies. But as Charles Sandberg said in response to the anti-Semitic ads, we never intended or anticipated this functionality being used this way, and that is on us. And I think it is. Um, but it's also indicative of the problem. So a site that was intended to be a way for students to keep up with each other is now truly a global platform, one that's largely automated and operating at a massive scale. And this makes moderating content in this ecosystem both very difficult and necessarily political. For example, in Myanmar, Facebook designated a Rohingya insurgent group a dangerous organization and instructed its moderators to delete any content by or in praise of the group. In Turkey, Facebook instructed moderators to limit criticism of Ataturk, depictions of the burning of the Turkish flags, and references to the PKK. In one period between January and June in 2015, Facebook made over 4,000 content restrictions in response to requests from the Turkish government. But moderation isn't just difficult for this kind of discrete political speech. Increasingly, platforms are forced to determine speech itself, and particularly around our limits to hate speech, enforcing their internationally developed norms, developed internally, and guidelines on billions, their billions of users. 
leaked training material from moderators of Facebook revealed some of Facebook's moderating policies recently, including, and this is a verbatim quote from their instruction manual, remarks such as someone shot Trump should be deleted because as a head of state, he is in a protected category. But it can be permissible to say, to snap a bitch's neck, make sure to apply all your pressure to the middle of her throat, or fuck off and die, because they are not regarded as credible threats. So free speech is complicated, and moderating it prevents, uh, presents a range of truly imperfect trade-offs and always has. Um, but what is undeniable, I think, is that we're increasingly outsourcing the critical role of our collective, uh, this critical role in our collective social bargain to private companies who moderate millions of posts a day in jurisdictions spanning the globe. A, a final point I want to make on the character of our civic discourse. Um, I think it's increasingly clear that the integrity of our democracy is more vulnerable than we thought. The story of foreign intervention in the last election is a rapidly evolving one, and I'm not going to walk through it here. Um, but needless to say, I think the twin structural problems of surveillance capitalism on one side and automation on the other have led to the weaponization of information for autocrats, democrats, and plutocrats alike. In countries around the world, platforms are being used to shape public opinion, disseminate misinformation, and foster unrest. Just yesterday, it was reported that many of the 3,000 ads being provided by Facebook to the Mueller investigation were explicitly designed to sow, di show, sow divisions among voters, some promoting, Hillary Clinton, Cl Cl some promoting Hillary Clinton's support for Muslim women, and others promoting anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant messages. It's been reported that Russian-linked groups use Facebook to organize anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim rallies via fake Facebook pages. And last weekend, German social media was literally flooded with bots spreading news, fake news of voter fraud. All of these interventions have the ultimate, and I think designed, effect of undermining the integrity of elections themselves. None of this implies malice from the platforms, but it does speak to the increasingly toxic nature of our civic discourse and the vulnerability of our democracy. Which brings me to the final argument I want to make or point I want to make. And, and, and that's that a, a, I think a set of legitimately empowering tools which these platforms have provided um, have been automated and scaled to a point where we need to have a conversation about how they fit into our democratic norms, regulations, ethics, and laws. I think we're heading into a genuinely new public policy train. And what is certain in the days is that the days of benign disruption and easy alignment between politics, policy, and Silicon Valley are over. Let me point out just three big challenges that I think we face in the policy world um, from this challenge, from this problem. Um, first, our, our public spaces are increasingly governed by private corporations. Facebook has, really, has done a tremendous amount of good. But they're also a public company that made $27 billion last year with investors who expect to make more and are, are required to ensure that the company makes more next year. This is a very strong incentive that may or may not be aligned with the public interest. At the same time, we're increasingly delegating governance decisions to them. Last week, Mark Zuckerberg announced, announced a series of smart, nuanced, and I think long overdue responses to this, to this very misinformation problem. Um, increasingly, and somewhat reluctantly, platform tech, platforms and technology companies are governing. And they may be the organizations that are best posi positioned to do so in this ecosystem. But the unilateral nature of this shift is something I think we need to think critically about. And as more social and political spaces move on to these platforms, which invariably they're going to, we need to think about the layered ways in which governance decisions in the public interest are being determined by ultimately private organizations. The, the second governance challenge, I think, is that governments are fundamentally ill-suited to regulate the scale, complexity, and rapid evolution of these platforms. Just to take one example, 
it's, it's clearly in the government's mandate, national government's mandate, to regulate ads during elections. In fact, um, the laws around transparency of advertising and oversight of advertising in the US were implemented to ensure that traveling candidates would not say different things to different audiences. But how do we monitor a candidate running 50,000 simultaneous micro-targeted ads? Um, or as I think what's gonna happen in the next elections, in upcoming elections, hundreds of interest groups, um, each running millions of micro-targeted ads. Facebook's solution to this problem is transparency to make these what they call, we call dark programmatic ads public. Um, but they, in this regard, they are taking on the governing rule, deciding what is a political ad, what isn't, how long will it be transparent, how long will it not, and just what does transparency mean when it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of, of different ads? What does that really mean to make that transparent? In addition to this, and I think sort of in, in, res in response to this to a certain degree, I think we're about to see a new wave of government interventions in this space around election financing, net neutrality, data privacy, and hate speech. Uh, we could see, I think, the banning of programmatic ads for political advertising. That's clearly something that could happen. Um, and we're really on the cusp and it's starting to emerge both in the public discourse and particularly in, in Europe, um, a, a reinvigorated debate about monopoly power and antitrust. Uh, but these are really crude tools designed probably for a different, different world, for a different corporate architecture. Um, and, and the problems we're facing and the governance challenges we're facing um, are at the same time getting radically more complex. Artificial intelligence will increasingly be the engine of our digital infrastructure, and yet these systems remain opaque, hidden from view, and ultimately unknowable even to the people who build them. I don't think we even have the governance language to begin holding AI accountable. Governments, um, Canada in particular in this case, are putting tremendous resources into building the industry of AI without the equally important task of understanding its social consequence on the economy, on our media, on our elections, on our justice system, on human rights, on our healthcare system, on how we kill and fight in war, and even how we perceive reality. Which is the final thing I wanna mention, um, which is the topic of reality. Um, I, I worry that we are at risk of losing grasp of what is real and what is fabricated in the digital space. As more of our lives becomes virtual and augmented by technologies we fundamentally don't understand, I think there's a need to seriously debate the role of facts and truth in our democracy. In this sense, the proliferation and monetization of misinformation and the dominance of algorithmic systems are not just political or public policy challenges, uh, um, they are, but they're also epistemological and ontological questions. When common perceptions of reality become ungrounded, when we no longer know what we know or how we came to know it, and when there's no common version of events, however imperfectly constructed, how does the society mitigate collective goods? Shared experience is at the core of democracy, and this, I think, is slipping away in very real ways. Um, this is a really hard problem, obviously, um, but I, I do think it's on our doorstep and we have to start thinking about it. Um, platform companies, just to conclude, began as tools to help us navigate the digital world, to connect us with our friends and family. These companies are now auto manufacturers, global advertising companies, telecoms, the central distribution channel for the free press, and critically, they're absorbing many of the functions we once delegated to democratic governments. So, Facebook didn't fail when it matched foreign agitators with micro-targeted US voter audiences, or when neo-Nazis used the platform to plan and organize the Charlottesville rally. It worked as it was designed. These design decisions are reshaping our society as a whole, and increasingly, I think, what it means to be human. Um, so I, I believe that this, at, at the very least, um, requires a new and reinvigorated debate about power 
technology and democracy. Thank you.